So the museum, as you know, it's a museum, has a lot of objects, but every object also has stories behind them. And uh, so tonight we're going to talk about a few of our famous objects, or even maybe not as famous, but just some interesting stories from the past of the museum. And uh, we're going to start with talking about the, uh, the Great Sphinx, the Sphinx that we have. It's not the great one. It's the third greatest, um, and, uh, which uh, came here 100 years ago in 1913, so it seems fitting to, to start. It's a massive object. It actually was not found on a museum excavation. It was found by Flinders Petrie, who is known as one of the fathers of Egypt. Egyptian archaeology. He is British. He dug in the late 1800s at almost every site and published just as much. And uh, early on, he um, was contacted by our first curator of the Egyptian section, who uh, this is Sarah York Stevenson. Uh, she was an amazing woman, one of the founders of the museum. And uh, even though she tried to establish a field project, uh, she in Egypt, she never was able to, but she contributed to the Egypt Exploration Fund, which uh, supported uh, Petrie's excavations. So for many years, we got uh, a lot of artifacts in that way. Um, Stevenson, unfortunately, left the museum in 1905 over a dispute, um, but their successor, well, the successor as director of the museum, uh, George Byron Gordon, I didn't put a picture of him here, You'll see him later, actually. Um, in 1912, apparently, uh, the museum had uh, started supporting Petrie again. And uh, he writes in his horrific handwriting, which is almost unreadable, that uh, during the summer we have raised at Memphis a colossal sphinx of Ramses II. Are you interested? So we, yes, we were. Um, it's obviously you've all seen it. It is an amazing piece. The head, unfortunately, had been um, was exposed to the elements for centuries, millennia, who knows, and so it's it's worn down. But the rest, it's just beautifully carved, still red granite, not your typical sandstone uh, that you see in Egypt. Um, well, I don't know why I'm resting on that slide. It's really not. Um, so, the, uh, so Petrie sent the uh, Sphinx by rail to Alexandria. Then he told Gordon, you're on your own. I don't know how to ship something this big. Figure it out. So they, but the, we had our, our, we'd been shipping things out of Egypt for years. And there, there was um, one of the shipping companies, forget now. Um, so uh, that was arranged. It's 12, it's over 12 tons. So it, not the easiest thing to move. Um, it finally got to Philadelphia uh, in, November, in October 1913, but it had to remain in, the, in the, the railroad yard because there was nobody prepared to move it here. They had to find special uh, movers. And uh, eventually they got this, and they had to build a special winch to get it up. Um, so, and there he is with uh, like an Arab uh, little headgear to protect it from the elements. When he arrived at the museum, he had to stay overnight in the street because they weren't ready. It was too late by then. Um, and uh, they had to put a guard out because people immediately started etching graffiti. They're, you know, trying to graffiti their names on it. Um, uh, but apparently, there was a big procession of Penn students um, that came along. Unfortunately, there's no pictures of that. Here's, uh, again, the, the movers. This guy over here was immediately hired as head of security, because <laughs> you, can, you can tell he knows he's in charge. Um, and uh, it was first moved to the upper courtyard. Here it is in a Charles Sheeler photograph. Sheeler is a famous artist. When but before he was famous, he freelanced uh, doing photography. Um, and here it was out in the elements in Philadelphia. And apparently, you know, several thousand years in Egypt are not as bad as three winters in the, oh, here's, sorry, three winters in the, the city. 
So geologists at Penn said, no, this has, you have to move it indoors. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to crack, and, and you're going to see the last of it. So it was brought inside first. Here you see it in the back uh, where, where the main entrance is, where the lobby is right there. There was no Egyptian wing yet built until 1926. And finally, it was moved in there. And um, here's the opening of the Egyptian wing and the lower Egyptian gallery with the Sphinx in the middle. Um, as you can see over the years, this is 1926 and this is 1996 or whatever. Nothing's moved in that gallery. It's <laughs> obviously too big. The Sphinx, and once they built the academic wing, meaning rainy right here, um, the Sphinx is basically sealed in. Um, and unless you want to break down the walls, it will remain there. Um, Oh yeah, another note though, you see the columns behind it, they're from the same site at Memphis, they actually uh, belong to the temple, uh, no, uh, throne room of the palace of Merempta, who was the son of Ramses II, so it makes sense that they're in the same room, although originally the columns are supposed to have gone upstairs, the floor was not made big enough, so now they're all together, but um, someday they might move them upstairs. We're going to move to another, a different piece entirely. This is from Sierra Leone, uh, the group known as the Sherbro. Uh, it was collected in 1937 by Henry Usher Hall. He had come here in the uh, mid-teens in 1915 after leading an expedition to Siberia. So the two expeditions he conducted for us were in complete opposite places um, in terms of climate. And, uh, and here's this horrible retouched photo of him and his partner uh, on the expedition to Siberia, Marie Antoinette Chaplitschka, who unfortunately uh, later committed suicide um, right after she heard the news that he married someone else. Or, yeah. Um, well, yeah, you know, it's not all anecdotes are funny. Um, some are. Um, so, well, unfortunately, Hall was here for a number of years. He was here for 20 years, but during the Depression, uh, he was, uh, the museum was forced to release him. Um, they also um, laid off the Asian section curator at the time. There, was, there were some protests, but um, that was the way it was. And, uh, but then what they did is they got a grant from the American Philosophical Society and they decided to augment it with a sale, the first and unfortunately not the last, uh, sale of actual objects from the museum. And this is the sales catalog. Um, and with that money, they were able to rehire Hall and send him to, Sierra, to an expedition to Africa. He um, originally wanted to go to Nigeria, but apparently it was more expensive, and he ended up going to Sierra Leone right here on the, you know, the, uh, the head, you know, the back of the head of Africa. And there's this tiny island, which is Sherbro. That's where he went. He chose those areas because they were, um, you know, as the custom of the time amongst anthropologists was to find the cultures that were least um, acculturated, least, uh, or at least obviously so, more conservative. And um, he ended up uh, going with his wife. Um, she paid her own way. Um, apparently, as soon as they got there, uh, they, as soon as the government realized that they had nothing to do with the collection of taxes or other government act activity, they were given free travel uh, in the country. Oh, here is when they reach. These are photos from Freeport, uh, which is um, the capital of Sierra Leone, or at least a oh, free town, sorry. Um, these are from a local studio, these giant panoramic photos. Um, and here's Hall's photograph of the same place. When he, here are some of his informants. So he decided to um, look at the two groups that live on the uh, island of Sherbro, plus a few coastal groups uh, right ac across the water. Here are some of his informants, and uh, it looks like a beautiful place. Just. It, hang out all day, right? Um, here, this is the town where he found the piece. The, that sculpture, by the way, is 
I should have said that at the beginning. The Sphinx, of course, did not need introduction, but that figure is called uh, Kambe Mama, and it's used in medicine uh, rituals in one of the societies in, uh, amongst the Sherbro, and it's particularly for women's issues or the like. Most of the secret societies are for males there, but this one society, the Yasi, is also for females, and it's run by a woman. And the uh, figure, is, the bowl is where you put, uh, you put a number of herbs and other medicines, and the figure is carried out when, when necessary. It's very complicated, actually, and I did not learn it as I was looking through this. Um, we, <laughs> um, here's, uh, well, I just put this in uh, an example of Henry Hall's handwriting. It's minute but very clear, just the same. Here is notes where he finds the, com he talks about the figurine. Unfortunately, he does, I could not find a place where he talks about whom he actually got that piece from. But um, he's here, but these are all photos from that town. Here they're husking coconuts, and there's a little helper there, of course, a couple other helpers. Um, and uh, she's doing something with palm oil, but Illustrative. Um, this is a stilt dance. Here's a stilt. He's on stilts, and uh, um, they're jamming it over there. Um, in the meantime, um, the uh, Mrs. Hall was very helpful, both in keeping accounts, daily accounts of everything, but also uh, she was allowed into some of the uh, areas where only women could go. So she also contributed to the ethnography. Um, from her notebook, we, she has a number of sketches in the back of her notebooks, just a little, and as well as recipes for banana souffle, um, and there's a few others in there, so we'll be distributing those later, and we, we tried them. Um, so uh, he came back, he spent seven months there, and he came back, and here's the bill of lading for his, the materials he brought back. Um, and uh, the, the piece is on exhibit right now as well. In fact, all the pieces I chose are on exhibit if you want to go see them later. Um, and now we're going to move on to another area. We're going to talk about Stila 14, another very famous piece. Um, so this dates to around 758 AD, and it, it depicts a ruler of Piedras Negras. Piedras Negras is uh, one of the more beautiful Maya sites. It's up in the middle, uh, completely inaccessible in the uh, hilly region of the Petén, uh, right along the Sumacinta River, which borders Guatemala and Mexico, and then drains in Guatemala. And uh, it's also famous for, here's the Sumacinta River from the museum's aerial expedition, 1930. Really beautiful. The site was discovered in 1898 by a German archaeologist. He was working for the Peabody Museum at Harvard. He uh, found all the stela there. I don't, we don't have a photo of stela 14, but there's another one very similar that he found. This is one of his photographs. Um, in the 20s, the Carnegie Institution of Washington went back there and they found their Stila 14 again in two pieces. There's the bottom part, the top part. And uh, then when the museum, oh, the museum decided to send an expedition there in 1930. Um, in uh, 30, they hammered out the agreement with the government, which at the time, uh, Guatemala by then was not allowing any antiquities to be removed from the country and we, were able to bargain a loan of ten, for 10 years of a number of monuments, uh, big monuments, uh, and, but we would also uh, take a number of them to the Guatemala City Museum, which was being built at the time. Basically, the idea is preservation, and we were gonna save them and also display them. And Piedras Negras, they, well, the justification was it's, it's so remote. In fact, even today, only about Maybe a couple hundred people make it all the way there. So, J. Allen Mason was our curator for many years. Here he is with a baby howler monkey in his arms with a little diaper. Um, he was the pet of the project. Um, 
This is how the museum found the stela in two pieces still, but uh, put next together, uh, next to each other. Um, so I mentioned the river. Um, the only problem, minor, to getting the, the monuments out was a stretch of rapids in the Sumacinta River, which meant that the museum had to build a 30-mile road in the middle of the jungle to avoid that part of the river. Once, once um, you reach that spot, they could put them on rafts. They would actually sail them down to Mexico, because Mexico is closer, and they would get on a boat there, and then the boat would actually go to New Orleans first, and then the Guatemalan pieces would be shipped back to Guatemala and the Philadelphian pieces. So these are the rapids, and yeah, not easy. So the Mason hired an American engineer he met in Guatemala City, uh, and he got him to start building the road. Uh, they used old uh, Chiclero trails and wood, uh, you know, mahogany uh, lumber trails, and, but the work was intense, no matter what, um, just because even between one season to the next, one year to the next, the road would almost disappear, um, and trees would fall over, the, the rains would wash half of it out. Um, oh, um, they bought a Fordson tractor to do the grading and to do some of the moving of the logs and other things, and uh, apparently that tractor is still there. <laughs> the, this photo was taken in 2007, and it's on Flickr, and uh, there it is. There's the Piedras Negras tractor. We, apparently it wasn't worth taking out of the jungle once it was done. Um, the other part of the problem was uh, lifting the monuments and preparing them to, to, uh, to, to ship. And uh, so they found a, um, a lot of uh, just used wood and mahogany. And here they are sawing giant saw. They were lucky that um, the chicle, the rubber collectors and the lumber um, workers were not, it wasn't the right season for them to be working, and so they were able to hire a lot of people with experience. Even so, it was um, a huge task. And uh, there's J. Alden Mason again, and a number of them. This guy's M.C. Todd. He, was, he ran a lumber concern in nearby, um, across the Mexican border. This photo is great. Here they are. Everybody working except this guy. Although he is holding the rope, but I don't know. So apparently, um, after they loaded up one of the wagons, it took off with one of the uh, monuments in it, and it apparently hit a snag, and it flipped over completely and landed in place. Unfortunately, there's no photograph of that. It was not recorded. But here's the, here they are loading on the, on the truck, then, you know, hauling by hand and hauling by oxen, and um, yeah, it just took forever. And in fact, the first season, they couldn't put, get the stuff out in time. Uh, they got to the area of, um, you know, by the river, but the rapids had swelled already, and so they had to wait the next season. And by then, they had to rebuild half the cases because termites had eaten them, and also the, the rise of the waters had flooded them. And even though they put them about 16 feet above level of the water at the time, it, um, it just, oh yeah, here's a little, so Piedras Negras right there, Mexico, right, Guatemala, and so there's the, the, down the river, and they went to Alvaro Obregón, then New Orleans, then all the way back to Puerto Barrios in Guatemala City, and to Philadelphia, and here's, here's uh, some of the documents, and then it wasn't over yet, because uh, then to get it in, get the stela. They had three stela and a number of other pieces. Um, the others were sent back to Guatemala after, well, they, did, they missed the 10-year mark because of World War II. They were sent back finally in 1947, but the museum asked to, um, to keep stela 14 and that weird head that's, a, you'll see it up in the gallery, that's a leg of an altar, um, and gave um, Guatemala, an exchange of, of uh, some of the gold from Panama that we had uh, 
uh, uh, acquired in 1940 or excavated in 1940. But at first, we had all, a number of the, the monuments. And here they are lugging them in. Um, I guess it's the, this is the back of the museum somewhere. Um, we could probably find the window. <clears throat> These are some of the pieces in Guatemala City, actually. Um, There's some of the steel that we took out, including the other three legs of that altar. We have the one, and they look really mean right there, all three together. Um, it was a good thing, though, we kept some of the monuments. Uh, it turns out that uh, this woman, Tatiana Perskuryakov, who began on the Piedrasnegos project in the late 30s because she was an unemployed architect, um, she went on to uh, study the, um, the, the hieroglyphics on some of the Piedras Negras monuments and was the first to realize that, uh, that the Maya were writing about real things and real events. Apparently, if you can believe it, up to that point, the, the great Mayanists were, they assumed that the Maya only wrote arithmetical and calendrical notations, dates, astronomy, but they didn't write about mundane affairs. They just didn't. Well, this one woman, she actually, even though not trained as an archeologist, um, she was able to um, uncover that. Oh, now we'll jump ahead to something else. This is the uh, famous crystal ball of the museum. And uh, this did not come from an excavation. This was, um, um, well, as you know, it's they've been delighting people for years. Uh, uh, this apparently belonged to the Dowager Empress Shi Shi, in, who died in 1908. Um, she was one of the, the last real monarch of China, but China was falling apart at the time. Apparently, she was not a beloved figure, and when she died, all her wealth or tomb, everything was ransacked. And so this piece, oh, here's a photo of Beijing, 1875. Looks like the far west, except for the roofs. The roofs are different, so you're not in Reno. Um, so apparently, the crystal ball surfaced at the John Wanamaker department store in 1927. Uh, the, and uh, this man, Eldridge Johnson, who had founded the Victor Talking Machine Company in Camden, New Jersey, later to be bought by RCA and uh, famous logo, um, everybody has seen it, uh, his master's voice. Um, he uh, saw this, the crystal ball in the store. Uh, Wanamaker had a, um, a Far East shop and an antique shop at the time. And uh, there's John Wanamaker in his later years at his desk. Um, and here's the, the Far East shop, John Wanamaker. They sent a man specifically to China to collect a number of pieces and they brought, and brought them back. As you can see here, it's on a different base than the one we, we use. Um, and um, Johnson wrote to Gordon, who was the director at the time, and said, oh, I saw this beautiful piece. It's so amazing. It's flawless crystal, 55 pounds, perfect. And, but they want $50,000 for it. Do you think that might be a little high? <clears throat> and uh, Gordon said, well, it's also kind of not in our area. It's 19th century. It's not really the type of stuff we collect in China. Um, uh, but then about a month later, he died. He fell down the stairs at the racket club, which still exists. In spite of us trying to sue them. No, we didn't. We didn't sue them. Um, and so, um, so Johnson decides he's going to buy the crystal ball after all, together with a number of jades and other pieces, and presents them. Yeah, this is John Wanamaker. Um, why do I have this again? Sorry. And he presents it to the museum as part of the Gordon Memorial Collection. And uh, the crystal ball was originally up the uh, top of the stairs uh, going up to Pepper Hall. And that's where it is here, so you can see the stairs right there. Um, it was later moved back a little bit and slowly made its way as a centerpiece of the rotunda. And it's been there, yeah, ever since, except for, oh yeah, except for in 1988. Some of these pieces, you know, they don't, their lives don't end when they come to the museum. They, they are, you know, they want to go out every so often. 
Apparently in 1988, while the museum was working on its life safety security system and its front entrance at the same time, and Panda decided to change the guards at the museum, we've had a new company. Some vandals came in and took uh, the crystal ball, the base, a statuette of Osiris, knocked over a couple other pieces and fled. And, um, and nothing else was heard. The base was recovered by a student the next day. Apparently it, had been, it was being used to, to prop the door open at the Hollenbach Center. It's a building on the South Street Bridge there. And he had taken a class at the museum. He recognized it and he brought it back. And that was very nice. But the other two pieces disappeared. And, um, you know, gloomy picture. And uh, so, yeah, how did we find it? It was a total surprise. This woman, uh, Jess Camby, uh, used, had worked, has, used to work here as a volunteer for many years, a research volunteer. Her book on the Urnamu Stila reconstruction is actually readable by all. <laughs> and um, apparently she was a, a thrift shop junkie, she claimed. And there used to be a little thrift shop on South Street uh, around 22nd, 23rd, around there. And, uh, oops. So she went there one day, and guess what? There was Osiris in the window. She tried to buy it right away, but they said, no, we just got it, we have to price it, we're not gonna let you have it. And, um, and so she came back to the museum and said, I think I found the piece. And uh, it turns out they, um, they asked the shop, and they said, where did you get this? And, uh, they had paid uh, $30 for it from Al, the trash picker, for, with, together with the table, you know, because the statuette wasn't worth 30 by itself. Uh, so they find, they get a hold of Al, the trash picker, and he says, yes, this guy was clearing out his garage at 23rd and Grace Ferry. He's moving out, and he had all this stuff in the lawn, and he said, yeah, take it. Um, so they find him, and then he says, yeah, yeah, there's stuff, there was this weird stuff in my house, in my garage, and I've allowed people uh, to store stuff here for decades, and I don't even know what's in it. And uh, apparently when he had found it, he saw the, this giant crystal ball and this little statuette, and he has thought it was an, uh, an alien egg, and the <laughs> Osiris was a little guardian. You know, and he was a little taken aback. He did not like the looks of the Osiris. That's why they were ugly. Um, and uh, so the crystal ball, he ended up um, giving it to his former um, cleaning lady who was also into the occult, and they were friends. Oh, wait. And uh, so she actually still had it, and uh, she had... Uh, uh, she had, had been a close shave, close call actually, because apparently when she first put it in her house, she put it in the middle of the living room, and she was about to go out, and uh, the phone rang, and she's like, oh, okay, gets the phone, she reaches over, she's just sitting on the floor there, and as she's talking on the phone, she feels something on her, on her arm, it's like, stop it, and it's the sun hitting the crystal ball, and it's burning her already after 30 seconds. And if she had left the house, her house might not have been there when she got back. So she quickly moved it, and uh, even though her husband used it as a hat stand, she was incredibly <laughs> grateful to just have had that piece in her possession for however many months that she did. And they never found uh, who did it. Uh, there was one latent fingerprint, apparently, on the crystal ball, but no scratches, nothing. And, um, and yeah, they came back. Um, and uh, Osiris, you know, gets often forgotten here because the crystal ball, you know, it's our crystal ball. And, but he was the guardian, after all. It did turn out that he was the guardian. Um, and uh, here's the Pico Tower, a little uh, time delay photo when it came back. And there's one tiny epilogue, uh, the, uh, a shout out for our business administrator, Alan Walt, who, when the insurance company, Cigna at the time, uh, paid up the very undervalued uh, insurance claim, when the stuff came back, technically Cigna owned the artifacts. 
And um, <clears throat> Alan Walt had, uh, this is over $100,000, obviously not what the stuff is worth, but this was the late 80s and the museum, you know, never has enough money and this was a recession in the late 80s. So $100,000, you know, everybody was after it and Alan Walt said, no, we're gonna put it in the reserves. And when the, the material came back, we were able to give the money back to Cigna. They didn't want the artifacts, uh, they were, yeah, it was very gentlemanly agreement, it was very nice, but sometimes it pays to, you know, just, no, not gonna spend it. And then of course, here's, you know, our really famous stuff. Um, uh, this is one of the treasures from Ur, the royal tombs of Ur, this is the uh, great bull-headed liar. And um, so Ur is a mythical site. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the Bible, everything. Um, it, the museum uh, decided to send a project there right after World War I. Uh, the Iraq had, it was part of the British mandate, so uh, George Byron Gordon again, the man with the mustache. He um, got in touch with T. Lawrence, uh, who is known better as Lawrence of Arabia, who not only helped the Arabs um, get the Ottomans out of Arabia, but also was a uh, sometime archeologist as well, and helped set up the antiquities department in Iraq. And he talks about somewhere in there um, how if they're gonna set up a project, they have to get a good archeology, span oh yeah, here it is, somewhat like a woolly, because we don't want to destroy more sites as has happened in the past. past. And in the bottom he says, this letter wouldn't look good in public, so please don't consider it official. So I hope uh, his copyright, his heirs don't come and take me for this, because it's public. No. Um, we also have a picture of uh, T. Lawrence, uh, just, it's in our archives, and um, for anybody who is, uh, might think of the movie Lawrence of Arabia with Peter O'Toole, one might get confused, you know, and think that maybe this is Lawrence of Arabia or this guy right here, you know, Arab garb and young and relatively dashing. Unfortunately, no, he <laughs> was not the superhero look. He's not Tom Cruise or whatever you think he should be. But anyway, there he is. Um, but uh, so we got in touch with the British Museum. We decided to do a joint project because um, the, again, the Brits were there and it made it seem to make more sense. Uh, we ponied up the money and they, um, as they later tried to remind the museum, ponied up the brains. And uh, they, we got Leonard Woolley. Here he is with his um, a longtime assistant, Al Hamoudi. Uh, who was worked with him in Syria and other places. Uh, Wally had already um, worked with the museum, actually, long before he was famous. Um, there, no, well, he's one of these guys. It might be, yeah, he's this one. Here he is in Egypt in 1909 or so. Uh, the museum funded a, a four-year project in Nubia in 1907, 1911, through Eckley Brinton Cox, Jr., after whom the Egyptian wing is named, and Eckley is here visiting with some of his family members, and they, um, this was the days, you know, he lived in style up in, the, they built the little house, it's pretty cute. Um, so Willie assembled a team at, uh, at Ur, and uh, the museum sent uh, their representative, was this man, Leon Legrand. Um, here's Mrs. Keeling, who later would become Mrs. Woolley and Leonard and, I don't know, Max Mallon? I'll, you won't know, I could just say any name, right? Here's, uh, <laughs> here's Leonard and uh, again, Mrs. Keeling. Apparently, uh, George Byron Gordon uh, did not think this was a seemly thing to have a female uh, uh, widowed woman uh, at the site and wrote to Woolley accordingly and to the head of the British Museum but Wooly said, I think this is my business, and she's a great volunteer, and, and you don't know the half of it, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so for the first few years, Gordon is complaining a bit about the division of fines, but then comes this telegram in January 4th, 1928. He wrote it in Latin so that 
because they're using the wires, you know, anybody could listen to in. And uh, here's the translation at the bottom. I found the intact tomb, stone built and vaulted over with bricks of Queen Shubad. That's how they transliterated the name at the time. Now it's Puabi. Adorned with a dress in which gems, flowers, crowns, and, and animal figures are woven. Two magnificent with jewels and golden cups. So, of course, everybody would love to write a telegram like that. Um, uh, and here, here's uh, the, the woolies, in fact, in one of the tombs, excavating some of the liars. Um, and here he's taking out another liar. In fact, they found loads of liars. Um, just, this is the silver one that we have downstairs, I think, that was conserved recently. And, and yeah, um, well, they found a lot of amazing stuff, period. Uh, this was a really, really famous excavation. It, uh, um, yeah, and, well, it was reported in the news a lot, even lurid tales like this. Grim tragedy of wicked Queen Shubad's 100 poisoned slaves. Science at last reveals how the greatest suicide pact in history was carried out of the, at the tomb of the beautiful Oriental ruler. And, and uh, you know, the fashion of 3000 BC as well. Um, so the only, um, you know, if there hadn't been King Tut, actually, to, or would be, it would be Queen Puabi, it would be her. But unfortunately, this thing happened a few years before, and uh, we were never quite as uh, famous. But even the John D. Rockefeller Jr. was sponsoring or, and it was, you know, everywhere. And then there's another interesting connection. In 1928, uh, Agatha Christie visited Ur on a tour of the Middle East, uh, where she met Max Mallowan, who was uh, Woolley's assistant. And uh, they married. And uh, she wrote a mystery about the, the, the Ur expedition. And um, she is very transparent in all the characters. In fact, there's a, there's a French priest who does epigraphy gee, who could that be? Um, and then, but the, and I'll, yeah, well, you'll, you'll, it's not the greatest mystery. The person who's killed off is the director's wife. And uh, <laughs> Mrs. Woolley was not the easiest person to get along with. And apparently nobody really liked her, except for Leonard Woolley. And, uh, and so uh, apparently Max Mallowan says in his memoirs that when she published the book, she was worried about hurting Mrs. Woolley's feelings. But as it so happens, and this is how Mallowan puts it, you know, people who are as self-involved as she was, she did not recognize herself at all in the, the character. <laughs> and so um, as it turns out, we have a photo of Mrs. of uh, Agatha Christie and Max Mallowan. It's actually 1949, so it's a number of years later. She's uh, visiting one of our digs, at, also in Iraq at the time. Um, Mallowan was head of the uh, Iraq Antiquity Service at the time. So there she is, a famous murder writer. And here's Mrs. Keeling again, uh, Leonard, Mrs. Woolley later. So again, the story doesn't necessarily totally end when the piece comes to the museum. So at first, so what they found really was only the head and this plaque, beautiful pieces, and the rest of it had to be rebuilt. And here, the first uh, reconstruction was done by uh, Mary Louise Baker, who was at the time museum artist, and she was one of the most amazing artists, or let's say illustrators, um, um, yeah, that we know of, and of course we're biased, but it's true also. <laughs> anyway, um, she built this little, cute little box, all decorated with little motifs, and um, there's a drawing by, by her also of the piece. Apparently she illustrated, she went to Iraq herself uh, to draw a number of the pieces uh, for the publications, but most of those drawings ended up um, with Leonard Woolley, and they're now uh, at Birmingham where his brother left them. Um, so we, uh, we have to go reclaim them. Um, so this photo, um, 
is from 1955. Leonard Woolley, a little older, uh, is visiting the museum to accept the Drexel Medal, which is an award the museum gives every so often to achievement in archaeology. And that was his turn. And the museum had just set up its Orr exhibit, had redone it, had renovated it. And here they are in the exhibit hall. You can't really see any of it. But here's Froelich Rainey, director of the museum, and an extremely young Bob Dyson, who used to be director of the museum. Um, and near, he was, well, he came here in the 1954, retired in 1994. And, um, and here he is. And so apparently somebody annotated this photo because it was so memorable. Uh, great moments in the lives of little people. And the quote is, this gallery is damn good. <laughs> Except there was a problem. He said that this reconstruction was all baloney. Um, it was conjured up, just made up. And um, the museum took a serious offense at this. And, um, and they were literally ashamed that they just let an artist make some fanciful thing. It's true, there were so many liars that she just imitated some of the decorations and some of the others, things like that. But the museum, eventually, they decided that they would rebuild it. And um, in the 70s, they came up with this, which unfortunately, because we don't know what it was, it was decorated with, it's been left blank. But it really probably was decorated. So. Maybe we can bring back uh, Mary Louise Baker's uh, reconstruction. As you may have noticed right now, it's actually not displayed on the, on the, the body. It's just by itself. Um, but that doesn't really matter as much. And that's the end. Thank you. Yeah,